Welcome to the Silicon Slopes podcast. I'm here with Ryan Anderson, who's the co-founder and CEO of Filevine. How are you? Hi, I'm really good. Thanks Thanks for taking the time. You guys are uh, office out of Sugar House, right? That's right. That's right. We love it up there. It's it's different, right? It's a little bit different than than uh, Lehigh. Lehigh is awesome uh, and is quite an ecosystem. But uh, yeah, I grew up um, kind of near Sugar House, and so it made a ton of sense for us. And I like the easy access to the slopes too. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. It's a cool little part of Salt Lake. It's got its own little culture, and uh, it totally does. Walkable. Yeah. yeah. But there's plenty of uh, kind of businesses there as well. There are, yeah. Um, so I mean, it's it's definitely growing. There's uh, the tech scene is getting better and better in that area. Uh, you know, we've got a couple hundred employees in our building, and then the rest are remote. But uh, it's fun. I mean, you know, everyone can walk to lunch. We've got Sugar House Park right there. Can kind of run laps uh, during the day. So it's it's awesome. We love it. I've, I've closed some big deals just walking around Sugar House Park. So it's it's fun. I like it a lot. The old walk and deal. Uh, a walk and deal. That's my style, man. Very yeah. cool. That's good. Good to know. And um, give us the uh, the story of Filevine. Oh, my goodness. I love talking about this. So uh, I practiced law for about seven years before kind of coming over to Filevine full time. Uh, and after leaving the law firm that I uh, was at coming out of college, I graduated from BYU Law School, uh, worked practiced law for about three years, then left to start my own firm. And after maybe a year, we had enough uh, clients that like there was a bit of a problem keeping track of them all. So we purchased a software called Clio, which uh, you're not familiar with, but anyone in legal tech would be intimately familiar with. It's kind of um, the the most known one in the market. And it was cloud-based, which was actually very new. Um, To this day, the vast majority of uh, legal tech software that kind of does what we do, which is case management, is sitting on servers. I know that is absolutely shocking in 2021, uh, but it's the case. Uh, it's still the case today. So uh, certainly, you know, back in 2012 or 2013, uh, there were very few cloud options and Clio was one of them. So I purchased Clio and used it for about a year, uh, but it just became very apparent that it wasn't doing what I needed it to do. Um, Clio make some assumptions about how a lawyer is going to work and is built for very small firms. And even though the firm I started was was quite small uh, by big law comparisons, um, you know, by the time we had five, six, maybe seven people, uh, we had a management problem. And uh, not only do we have to manage the cases, but we had to manage our employees who are managing the cases. And so at that point, uh, I realized Clio wasn't going to do what we needed it to do. And I started looking for other options. There were plenty of options, but as I mentioned before, all those options were server-based, uh, which didn't seem to make much sense to me. And uh, fortunately, I had a couple friends who were developers and kind of walked them through this problem. Uh, one of my friends who was a developer, I actually, I'll never forget, uh, he he and I were talking one morning and I was kind of outlining the problem to him and I'd been talking to him for a while about this. And he said, why don't we go get breakfast? And I said, yeah, let's do it. And so this is Las Vegas um, and it has the best Mexican food in the world. I'm including Mexico in that so far. Got it. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I might be joking a little bit, but the Mexican food in Las Vegas is just off the charts good. And there was a breakfast burrito place on Charleston of Maryland. For those who are familiar with Las Vegas, you'll kind of get, get where that area is. So we go have an incredible breakfast burrito and I outline the problem to him. And he said, you know, there's this guy who is the best developer I've ever met. Uh, He's just incredibly wise and smart and thinks through elegant solutions to complex problems. Um, And he actually just left um, our company and is looking for another job. I think he was looking at Amazon at the time. But this friend of mine said, you should talk to him. Uh, And so the next day, unbeknownst to me, uh, Jim Blake was sitting in my office. (laughs) Um, And uh, little did I know at that point that he would be my co-founder. So uh, sitting in my little tiny law office, I walked Jim through the problems we faced as lawyers and kind of the problems I personally faced, but those problems were felt broadly by everybody who practiced law, especially in kind of that setting where there's just a lot going on. Uh, I handled everything from just a small car accident to medical malpractice cases to multi-state large-scale class actions. And um, the more complex, the harder it was to manage. Um, And there was just nothing out there that did that. And so that very day, we uh, kind of 
thought through what would need to happen to make this problem easier for lawyers. Um, and uh, he said, hey, you know, let me take some time. I'm, I'm, I've got some offers. Um, and But he said he was going to take a week or two before he decided on where he was going to go work next. And during that time, he said, hey, I'll, I want to kind of research this problem. So he spent some time in my office. He probably spent two or three days just in my office talking to people. Then he asked me to introduce him to friends of mine who were lawyers, which he also did. And so he spoke to them. And then he spent a day or two just in court watching uh, how lawyers operate in a courtroom, which, uh, you know, is pretty boring. Uh, I've done that a lot of times. And, um, you know, court can be extraordinarily, extraordinarily exciting. But for the uninitiated, it's probably not the most exciting thing in the world. But he spent a bunch of time there. And then came to me probably 10 days later uh, with a big set of documents in his hands uh, that had essentially schematics for building um, a case management system. And he said, look, this should get anybody started. Um, I'm happy to jump on a phone with somebody who would like to do this. Obviously, like I've got a real job. Uh, I think he was headed to Seattle and, you know, he said, but, but best of luck to you. Mm. Um, and at that point, I, I just kind of knew that this was never going to get off the ground unless this guy was going to do it. So uh, if I've got any kind of superpower, it's getting really smart people, people much smarter than me, to kind of come on board and, and join me in kind of initiatives. And this was one. And so I asked Jim, hey, let's let's do this together. And he was quite resistant because uh, I didn't have, you know, any kind of company or any kind of tech background. Um, but I walked him through what I thought we could do and how deeply felt these problems were by lawyers and how there wasn't really anybody addressing them in this kind of way. And he said, okay, let me see how it goes. Um, and I think in his mind, he meant like a few more weeks, uh, but it was several more years. And uh, uh, he is uh, just a dear friend, probably one of my best friends in the whole world to this day. And, um, you know, he and I are kind of largely responsible for getting five on uh, up and off the ground. Very cool. Well, you got what some might say lucky with uh, this um, meeting with Jim and yep. you got your technical co-founder. Right. Which you, uh, to your point, you wouldn't be, have been able to do anything oh, no. without. All right. So um, for the uninitiated, you can go off of movies or TV shows, but um, law has a lot of documents and phone calls and... Uh, edits and I can yeah. imagine it's just a, a nightmare that most people wouldn't want to pursue. But if you're in it and you have to just deal with it, you're probably always looking for solutions, which is what sounds like you were doing there. Yeah. Um, so at some point you have to have the conversation with yourself, maybe a spouse, others of like, I'm going to make the jump. When did you guys decide to do that? At what point was the software, the product ready? Yeah. So, um, I had kind of been doing both though. Um, I probably, you know, there's a demarcating line. I, I did a trial with my old law firm in, in November of 2016. Um, and I told them at the time, Hey, you know, after this, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on Vava and the majority of my time. And, uh, they all said, okay. And, and I had other partners at the time. And so they sort of got it and they were okay with it. Um, and then throughout the course of 2017, uh, we did a series, our, our series seed and series, I guess not series A, but our series seed and, and angel investment. And uh, that was mid 2017. And I remember talking to the investors and album was one of them. Back then it was an album. It was uh, Peak Ventures. Right. Um, but I remember talking to John Mayfield and then um, the former CEO of uh, Dealer Socket, which is... Uh, has a big office just there in Draper. And uh, they both said to me, look, this is the time. Uh, we're putting our money into this business. We believe in you, but we want you to be fully committed to it. And they also said, like, there's really no conception of doing this without being where the team is. And at the time I was living in Las Vegas, but uh, you can't beat Utah for sales talent. So the sales team was up here and, and some of our engineers were up here. And so the majority of the team, almost all of them really, except for myself, or in Utah. And uh, they just impressed upon me that if, if, if I was going to make a go of this, I needed to move. That was a hard thing to hear. Uh, I had a, a very happy life uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, my kids were happy. I was happy. We had you know, a great group of friends and a great community. And I loved uh, the city of Las Vegas. I still do. Um, 
uh, you know, five of my children were born there and uh, my wife is born and raised there. And so we had built um, just a, a network of, of great people who we really enjoyed being around. And I remember first having the conversation with my wife and she was definitely in tears <laughs> over it. And, you know, I don't know that I was too happy about it, um, but I knew I wanted to make the move. Um, and I have roots in Utah. I was born in Provo and grew up in Salt Lake City. And so, um, you know, as we thought about it over time, uh, I just said, look, I don't think I'll be okay uh, with my life if I don't pursue this. Um, and she's awesome and accommodating and a sweetheart. And she said, okay, let's do it. So um, we moved to Utah in 2018. And, you know, ever since, Filevine has been my thing. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, how many employees are you guys up to now? Uh, I think we're over 400. Um, now, oh. I'm not counting um, about 60 to 70 um uh, call answering folks that we have. We have a little call answering service that's part of the company, but very small in terms of revenue. Um, so there's uh, there's about sixty of those that are in Provo, but other but not not counting that. I think we're about four hundred. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So you have the conversations. You build out the the basic framework. You raise a little bit of money. Now you need to run with the company. That's right. Which involves a little bit of marketing, a little bit of sales. Oh my gosh. A little yeah, bit of fundraising. Right. So uh, describe those days. Where did you put your focus? How did you guys sell your your products? How did you develop new products? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's absolutely the case that uh, a CEO at that stage really needs to kind of do all of it. Uh, so uh, I was jumping on planes, going to big sales calls. Uh, Filevine is uh, maybe I would consider it kind of high mid-market, low enterprise is kind of our sweet spot. So we routinely sell deals uh, in the 50 to $250,000 range. That's the majority of our business. And, uh, those kinds of deals, especially on that upper, uh, echelon, you know, kind of above 200,000, uh, it's much easier to do those kinds of deals if you're actually in the room with somebody. Uh, and so this is obviously pre COVID. And so I was getting on a lot of planes. Uh, I traveled a lot. Uh, and not only would I travel out to sell a customer, but I was, I would also travel out to implement a customer. Um, you know, Filevine is is different than a lot of software, I think, in the Valley in that um, it is truly can't live without its software. And, and what I mean by that is we're actually replacing something in almost every case. So it's not like we go into a situation and we so, show somebody Filevine and they're like, oh my goodness, this is a great idea. Uh, we should start using this. They look at it and go, oh yeah, this is way better than what we have now. Um, but replacing what we have now will, will be a nightmare. And it is indeed a challenge to replace the software that is already kind of the the spinal cord for these law firms. But uh, once once we kind of tear that out and put Filevine in, uh, the engagement's through the roof and our customers buy a ton more of Filevine, so it, it makes it worth it. But yeah, so I mostly spent my time selling and implementing Filevine for the better part of two years and, and over that time hired some early executives. So the two that come to mind, kind of, uh, there are probably two or three early execs that I should mention. So Travis Tidball, who's EVP of Marketing and Growth at Filevine today, uh, he came on board when we were just about $2 million in ARR. So he's seen us on quite a ride and, um, you know, we're, uh, we've done quite well over the past few years. And so uh, it's it's fun to see Travis be at a company that is, you know, 20x the size of, yeah. uh, of what it was when he first got here. And uh, tra um, uh, Sean Dowdle is our SVP of sales and has just built, I, th I, at least in my opinion, the best sales team, uh, in the state. He is just remarkable. And from a sales efficiency perspective, we've always been very efficient on our sales team. And that's particularly true since Sean came on board. Um, there's so many others, Michael Anderson, uh, who's my little brother who came over from, uh, Goldman Sachs has kind of been running operations and finance at Filevine for a long time. So getting that early set of execs together has been awesome. And it's been a really stable group. Uh, those those folks have come on. They have um, kind of exceeded my ever expectation, and I couldn't have done it without them. Like I say, I'm, I'm really only good at one thing. That thing just happens to be recruiting. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, but it's a good feeling when you can uh, pass some of the duties off to others and just right. have 100% trust. All right, so um, there's a lot of law firms out there in the there world, are. right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, there's a lot of ways to sell things, whether it's a car, a, a legal tech software. How do you guys, like, 
thirty thousand foot view go about selling and, and implementing these customers? Yeah. So the sale is um, about two thirds of our sales are um, taking an inbound lead uh, and then calling that customer. So some of that's done by an SDR, some of it's done by an AE. Depends on kind of the warmth of the lead, and we have some lead scoring that tells us, you know, whether this lead is should be contacted immediately by an account executive or if it needs to be nurtured by the SDR team. Um, and then we do have an outbounding motion from our uh, from our kind of outbound SDR teams. They're calling into mostly, I would say, kind of upper SMB, low mid market firms. They do do a little calling out to enterprise, um, but by the time you get to again 100, 200, 300 thousand dollar deals, yeah, most of the time that requires um, a kind of a, a penetration and kind of really thoughtful outreach um, from somebody who's going to spend quite a bit of money on your software. So. For that, we're usually doing something like, you know, having having an AE work the relationship over the course of months and sometimes years. Uh, we're doing a lot of brand work. Uh, we go to a lot of conferences. Um, so Filevine this year will attend 75 trade shows. Now, keep in mind it's COVID, so I, I think about half those trade shows have been remote. But still, you can run the math. Basically, every week we have a team at a trade show. Uh, and that's been remarkably effective for us. One thing that's so great about lawyers is uh, they tend to be very um, community oriented. They talk a lot amongst each other. Uh, they're, you know, I mean, litigators fight with each other, but at the end of the day, they want to share best practices. And so when they get together at things like a trade show or a continuing legal education event, you know, lawyers have to have to go through these series where they uh, listen to courses every 10, every Every year, they have to do some number of hours of continuing education. And so when you go to these events, they're very much into kind of sharing best practices with each other. And of, of course, running a firm and the software that you might use to run a firm falls squarely in that. So um, trade shows have been a really good thing for us. Um, so yeah, we use that. We also um, uh, have really built up, I think, somewhat organically, but but our VP of uh, Strategic Partners, uh, Eric Bermudez, who's just done a fantastic job, has uh, kind of helped build what was already happening organically, which was a bit of a partner channel network. Um, and that's become a bigger and bigger part of our sales motion. It now accounts for about 20% of our deals, but last year it only accounted for about 10. So I could see that being a 30, 40, 50% um, kind of part of our motion going forward. There's a lot of folks out there servicing law firms. That's a that's kind of a, a normal thing in our community. And so um, the more we gain the trust of those channel partners, the more I think we'll likely use them to kind of help service our customers. What's nice about something like that is not only might a channel partner bring us a deal, but um, they may want to help us implement that customer. And they can also kind of be the on the grounds person over the long run. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not something I think a company can do too early. Uh, we've had to take our time in building that channel network. But now that we've reached a certain level of size, uh, it's, you know, we can credibly say to a new partner, hey, look, you can make a living installing Filevine and, and supporting Filevine in your community. Yeah. And I guess the uh, the best sales person platform is just a referral from someone that likes it and tells their, by uh, far. their buddy. Yeah, by far. No question about it. Very cool. Okay, so in the news, there's a talk of like great resignations, right? Yeah, everyone's quitting. Apparently. <laughs> everyone's quitting. So we'll see if uh, like the key people in society, if they just keep quitting, we'll just uh, yeah. Stop I don't know. Right? It's, it's getting it's getting pretty crazy. Fortunately, I don't think we've had too much trouble at Filevine. We we have lost a few a few good people, but but generally, I think we've done pretty well uh, retaining our great folks. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. So if this is true, that everyone's quitting and yeah. There's, there's, resignations all over the place. What are you guys doing to combat that? Well, look, so much of it comes down to culture. Um, and when I think about the culture at Filevine, um, it, we are undergoing a bit of a shift. You know, as I kind of walked through the story of how I started the software and, and, and the company, it was very much a scrappy kind of do what it takes to get the next step done kind of initiative-based way to approach company building. Um, and that, that works really great up to you know, a certain amount of ARR, but to go to that, that $100 million ARR level, it's going to take um, kind of a much more, I think, rigorous uh, way to scale. And so as you kind of change out the culture from a, a very scrappy, uh, go to what it takes, raise your hand, be involved, tackle any problem you see kind of culture to a 
uh, a, a culture that is more rigorous, more thoughtful, uh, more methodical in in the way it kind of goes about things. Um, it, it attracts a different kind of person. Um, and it, it might also mean that, it, you know, it's time for, for other folks to kind of say, hey, may, maybe this isn't my the stage where I'm going to be most effective. So there is some of that. But when I think about kind of the culture that should retain somebody, they should want to be at Filevine um, because of the people that they get to work with. Uh, I get to work every single day with people who are smarter than me, people who have high expectations for themselves and in turn represent those expect expectations back to me. Um, so if you're working in a place where, um, you're attracted by the talent, you're attracted by the expectation level, um, then, you know, it's secondary things like, um, pay and compensation and, you know, how many activities you do together, all those things have to be there. Um, and we can talk about the things that Filevine does specifically, but the number one thing is, are you attracted to the kind of people that work at that company? Um, and at Filevine, I, I think we are incredibly picky about who we bring in um, because we want to maintain that level of, wow, when I walk in the door, there are a lot of smart people. Um, we recently brought in um, our head of legal um, from a very prestigious firm in Salt Lake. Um, and uh, I probably shouldn't out this guy, but he he took a pay cut, a, a significant pay cut uh, to come work at Filevine. And... Uh, his first uh, kind of sit down with our senior team, which is kind of the decision-making body at Filevine on the management side, he said, I just can't believe every single one of these people, but they're just so smart. They're so articulate. Um, and he's attracted to that. He wants to be a part of that, even though economically it might not be the most important thing. Um, he, he wants to be a part of, of a group of people that are doing something extraordinary. And unfortunately, you know, Sometimes that means you have to have extraordinary people in those seats. So uh, we try to be very thoughtful about who we bring on board and um, make sure that they're going to be part of that culture of excellence. Um, and those who are attracted to that will want to stay. Um, yeah. Now, you got to have competitive pay. Uh, you've got to have a competitive benefits. Um, you know, uh, I think it's more critical than ever that um, Filevine look towards, and, and all companies, uh, you know, in Silicon Slopes and, and throughout the world, um, seek to increase the level of the their uh, candidate pool so that they're getting more diverse candidates, they're getting candidates from different backgrounds. Um, we want to be the kind of place that you can bring your whole self into work um, and feel comfortable uh, in being who you are in the workplace. Um, and you don't have to fit a specific mold to come work at Filevine. Um, uh, so yeah, we're really proud of that, and I think I think we do a good job. You know, I don't want to compare ourselves to any other company, but but I think if you were to walk inside Filevine, you would find um, a, an above average level of diversity for a Utah company. Got it. Yeah, maybe the great resignation is like people don't care about pay as much as just being happy for forty to fifty hours a week instead of. That's right. Maybe that's the it. reason. I think you got it, Garrett. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got a good culture and a good place to work you might have a leg up even if you're not going to pay right i want to be clear i think we pay just fine yeah. <laughs> i think we have extremely competitive pay but but you're absolutely right um and in fact look i mean you're not going to attract extraordinary level talents if you don't compensate them in the way that they deserve yeah. but that's a second order uh way to attract and retain talent the first thing is do these folks want to be around people like them who are doing big things and expect a lot of themselves and the people around them? Yep. Yeah, there is a line, right? Like, I'd rather be a park ranger than any other job, but it's just like, uh, I can't, you know. <laughs> right, of course. There's that line. <laughs> right. Maybe in the future. Um, okay, so uh, growing the company and scaling it, bringing on executives with experience, and you've got to do that, right? Like, yep. you get to a plateau, and then there's climbers that can go further. Right. Um, and so <clears throat> that it pr would probably include, you know, sales and then, you know, upselling with new products and stuff. Sure. So let's talk about products. How do you guys devise new products, new features? Uh, how do you build those and how do you roll them out? Yeah. Uh, I, I saw a tweet by a fellow Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneur, and, and I, I'm probably going to get the name wrong, so I won't say it here. But I, I think the, the argument was, Customers are really good at telling you what's missing from your product or where you can iterate your product. 
customers tend to be um, a little bit less effective on coming up with big new ideas. Um, both are, are super critical. Uh, we're rolling out um, our time and billing feature at Filevine. Uh, we've spent years on it, um, and there are years left to be spent on it. And it is foolish and um, prideful for us to think that there is any way to build that tool but to be very in tune with the customer base, talking to them on a continuous basis, understanding where the product can improve, what kind of blockers they're going to face as they're using that product, um, because it is a system of record and something they rely on every single day. And and there's a, a well set of, uh, a well understood set of, of requirements to build a feature like that. Um, so it's going to take years uh, of, of customer interactions to get that right. And I can tell you, I preach nothing more then you you talk to those customers, you understand their needs, and actually you know watch them use the software to see where they're getting blocked uh, to understand their needs. That said, the most innovative things we've done at the company have usually come from really smart people um, thinking up entirely new ideas that didn't exist before. So I'll, I'll mention one. Uh, kind of the biggest uh, vision initiative that we're engaging in at Filevine is an entirely new platform for legal authoring, the way that lawyers actually write. For a very long time, uh, lawyers have written every single thing they write in Word. Uh, and Word actually wasn't kind of built for lawyers. Ironically enough, Utah has a special place in a lot in the hearts of a lot of lawyers because of WordPerfect. Uh, WordPerfect to this day uh, is used by a lot of lawyers, which is uh, a challenge actually cuz you know it's 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 pretty old software but still beloved in some corners of the legal community and it really um spoke to that market um word has a whole bunch of challenges in that regard and really wasn't built with lawyers in mind at all um and the reality is uh any tool that relies on word for legal authoring is going to come up against kind of a, a lot of problems in dealing with kind of the Byzantine Microsoft API architecture um so we said, what if we were to start from the ground up and think through how can we build um, a legal authoring tool um, that is built for lawyers uh, from day one? Um, and uh, we researched it for quite a while and then eventually found a company out in New York that was doing something very similar. And um, after several conversations with their founders, uh, was able we were able to acquire them. Uh, and I'll tell you, the demand amongst our customer base for that tool is off the charts. Um, we have to hold our customers back from purchasing it simply because there's there's probably more we need to do, uh, but they still buy it anyway <laughs> because there's such demand to have a kind of, you know, by legal, for legal um, uh, tool to, to write documents. Um, the work of a lawyer isn't really done in a document. Um, that's always been my point of view. The work of a lawyer <sighs> is done in conversation and in thought. Um, so, and, and I think that's true for a lot of things, by the way. I think it's actually true for coders um, and developers. I think that the, the hardest part is knowing what to code. Um, and then the actual coding is, is, is almost secondary. And that's definitely true for lawyers. Um, the decision about what to do, whether it's a will or an estate plan or uh, a transaction, whether it's a venture deal, uh, whether it's a lawsuit, um, what goes into the document is the result of all sorts of thought and counterpoints uh, between perhaps you and your client, between you and an investor, between a lawyer and other lawyers at that firm. And there's a lot of, of kind of strategic discussions that go into what a document ultimately will be. Once that strategic discussion is done, then you actually craft the document. Those discussions are held in Filevine. We're really good at that. I think we're the best in the world. Um, but the actual drafting of that document, which is uh, the actual work product that's based on all those discussions, we haven't really handled that. We've just relied on Word up to this point. Um, so that is a, a big idea that probably wouldn't have come from our customer base directly, right? If you asked our customer base, they probably would have said, well, you need a better Word integration. Mm. Um, and so uh, so I, I think it's, it's both. Um, it, you really need to be able to do both. Very cool. Yeah, that one sounds like a big, uh, big lift. It's a huge lift. And uh, I hate when contracts come over in word from lawyers or partners and there's just a bunch of red lines. Yeah, it's awful. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> it's my, it's mind numbing. Oh, it's, it's the awful. worst. It's the worst. Yeah. It, the only thing that is worse is like a, a spreadsheet 
with uh, four or five sheets and like <laughs> That's cascading. all these tabs like, and really? right. You don't know what what the formulas are going to do. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I read one this morning. The Green Bay Packers are offering um, shares. I, I saw that. Yeah. It doesn't get you anything. And I was able to learn that really quickly because it's just a really concise three-page oh, document, right? Okay. You get a, one vote per share. You don't get swag. You don't get anything. And it was just outlined clearly versus right. some of these other documents that come our way. And we're just a small nonprofit. Right. And, um, you know, all right, all right I'm going to concentrate and read this. Right. And by the end of it, you, I feel like dirty. I was like, <laughs> this is not good. So if you guys can help solve that and make it probably smaller less uh, wordy right and easier through the discussions and then yeah yeah i'll be a fan of that it would be it would be a big thing well that's that's where we're headed very cool yeah and um yeah last question um how do you now as you've transitioned several times into ceo of x ceo of x like yeah more money more responsibilities more employees more yeah. everything right how do you now kind of envision your days um, your weeks, how do you, uh, position your time and energy so that you can keep growing the company? Yeah, I'm probably a bad example. If I'm being honest, I, I do work quite a bit. Um, so if there's something that suffers, it's probably actually not the family time, but it's probably social time. So I, I'm, I, I bet you I'm one of the least social CEOs in Silicon Valley in Silicon Slopes. Um, you know, I, I really concentrate on, on the job and family time. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't do a lot of, you know, boys trips and, and that kind of stuff. That's sort of not on the radar for me. It, it, it's a little bit less appealing than I think it is for some folks. So, um, so yeah, I mean, those are the two things I'm focused on. Um, look, there will come a day when uh, I, I dial it back, um, but it's years from now. Um, so, yeah, my day looks, looks pretty heavy. I mean, you know, this morning I was up uh, at the gym at 5 a.m., uh, which means I woke up at 4.30 um, and you know, I'm sure I won't finish working till seven, eight o'clock at night, if not a little later. Um, but I, I, I actually think most of the CEOs, uh, in town are probably similar if they're being honest, it's kind of hard to turn off our job. Um, I, I even feel that way on vacation, you know, I'll take vacations. Um, but, but my wife, my kids, they all know, like, I'm going to take some phone calls. I'm going to answer some emails. I'm going to respond to some Slack messages. Um, and that's that's just kind of the trade-off uh, to run a company at this scale when the stakes are this high and this many lives and this many you know kind of livelihoods are on my shoulders. Um, and and for us, it's it's not just that. I mean, you know, Fileline has about twenty five hundred law firms, uh, more or less. Um, and some of those law firms are, are very large. Some of them are medium, and some of them are small. But every single one of them has critical data in their system that they cannot live without. And if they need to call it up at any one moment and a file line isn't working or has a bug, um, it, it, it the consequences are dire um, in some cases. And so, um, you know, if there's, if there's a problem with the software, uh, I can tell you I'm taking that call. It does not matter when uh, yeah. that call comes in. So um, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility and I've sort of kind of normalized a, a, a busy high stakes life. Um, I don't always want it to be like that, but I, well, like I say, for the next few years, I think it will be. Yeah. Yeah. We need to come up with a new word for vacations for people that don't actually, <laughs> that's right. They're there, but not there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't want to bring it up, but like your client base are, uh, opinionated by nature. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And, uh, kind of aggressive by nature. <laughs> that's correct. Um, so that you got your, your work cut out for you. With I do. Base. They're, yeah, I mean, so you're right. They're aggressive and they're opinionated by nature. Um, you know, some of them literally get paid to kind of go to court and fight with other people. So uh, it takes a special kind of person that gets joy out of like going into a courtroom and and making another lawyer look bad. Um, oh, yeah. But many of them, that's exactly their job. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, and, and I'll kind of go high level here. The American system of justice is the best in the world. It's incredible. Um, when you go to buy a carton of milk, you know it's going to be safe for a bunch of reasons. The FDA has uh, made sure of that, but you also know that if it wasn't, if somebody got sick, you could sue. Um, you know that that car insurance policy that you bought, 
is going to protect you in the event of an accident. You know that your health insurance is actually going to have to pay, and if they don't, you can hire a lawyer to help you. That is not true in so many parts of the world. We expect our judges to be impartial, and my experience as a lawyer is that they are. Um, certainly, there, there are criticisms that can be levied at lawyers, at judges, at, at uh, you know, uh, the Department of Justice, the, you know, lower level kind of prosecutors, uh, state, state offices, all sorts of things. I'm, I am sure all of it can be improved. But by and large, the U.S. system of justice is extraordinary. It is an entire branch of government, and yet it has largely been ignored by the technology community for a very long time. That's ending. Um, the venture community has finally woken up to the dire needs um, in, in law and uh, is addressing them. And, uh, you know, there's there's a huge amount of money flowing into legal tech more than ever before by by a huge amount. Uh, it was once the case that when I would pitch Filevine, people would say, yeah, 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 great business. Like, clearly there's a lot of traction here, but I don't know if we see a billion dollar outcome. Nobody thinks that anymore. Nobody thinks you. that anymore. Yeah. Well, congrats on all your success. And again, thank you uh, for taking the time and joining the Silk and Slopes podcast. And we'll look forward to your uh, continued news and announcements of growth and fun and building these products. <laughs> thank you, Garrett. I appreciate it. You bet. Ha have, have fun on your hunt. Appreciate it. Yeah.